Good evening, everyone. I'd like to first uh, bring greetings on behalf of the 400,000 members of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and also to personally express my gratitude to the people who make this incredible institution run. And uh, let me just put the names that I know, Ms. Tanji Gray, Ms. Rashonda Silas, and Mr. Stephen Klein. Um, I know that at our place, we often don't recognize the people who do the work every single day. So as part of the season of repentance that us Jewish people are about to come in, I thought I would start early tonight. And in addition, I'd like to thank the incredible staff of the Foundation for California, including Rafael Rodriguez, Jesus Rodriguez, of course, Dr. Balitzer, Rod, and uh, Ted Gover, who's traveled literally around the globe uh, with me to uh, bring the message uh, of Courage to Remember to uh, literally every continent uh, in the world. I was very moved by uh, all of the comments, uh, both by uh, politicians and others. I also want to recognize and thank the chief for being here, probably the toughest job in any city. And thank you for being part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Um, Kwanzaa, you mentioned that you were in Germany and how that experience changed your life. Well, I just actually arrived from Berlin and uh, two days ago had a press conference um, uh, in Berlin dealing with the hatred on the ground right now that's going on in Europe. And to know how, especially for the young people, how blessed we are as Americans, the press conference took place across the street from Humboldt University. And halfway between that historic univer German university and the hotel where we had held the press conference, right in the middle was a plaque, and that was the place in 1933 where they burned the books. And as uh, a philosopher by the name of Heine had written a hundred years before, where they choose to burn books, they will someday burn people. So the blessing that we have uh, to be here at the King Center and everything it stands for, and the blessing and opportunities we have to live in, uh, with all of our flaws, the most cherished place on earth, the United States of America, was brought home to me in a very, very powerful way just the other day. I'm um, going to apologize to the uh, rule book but after all, I am a member of the clergy, and this is a podium. <laughs> and, and you're going to hear the chauffeur blowing in a few minutes, and next Wednesday night is Rosh Hashanah, and we've entered the period of time where if you lie, you're in really, really bad shape. So I cannot tell a lie, but bear with me because the comments uh, that I make tonight are heartfelt, not only on behalf of the institution, but I think also on behalf of a generation of Jews, who, like myself, uh, were just a bunch of teenage punks when Martin Luther King was putting his life on the line and changing the world for us. And also, uh, my words will be published tomorrow uh, in a publication called The Hill in Washington, D.C., because I think our elected officials sometimes have to be reminded on whose shoulders they stand. Since 1988, the Simon Wiesenthal Center's Courage to Remember Holocaust exhibit has traversed the globe. As you heard from Dr. Balitzer, opening in Vienna on the very street where hordes of Austrians hailed Adolf Hitler as their savior in 1938. Courage has been viewed by millions from Buenos Aires to Beijing, New Delhi to New York, Bangkok to our home in Los Angeles, Miami, Mumbai, but tonight, as we presented here in Atlanta, we have finally found a perfect match, a match in the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., who always had the courage to remember. No, Dr. King did not fight the Nazis during World War II. He was only a teenager then, though many African Americans fought, bled, and died in Europe so others could live. MLK emerged after 1945 into a changing world 
in which the U.S. struggled to solve the, what was called the American dilemma of racial inequality at home. At the same time, it was promoting democracy abroad. We think of M.L. King, and when you go through the exhibits here, you absorb it. Still in his 20s, I think he was much older there, emerging meteor-like to articulate the goals of the spontaneous nonviolent protest against Jim Crow ignited in Birmingham in December 1955 by St. Rosa Parks. Yet Reverend King viewed uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference movement not only as a Southern crusade against Jim Crow, but as a national crusade on behalf of racial equality and as an international crusade to share the best in the American dream. Black troops were present at Buchenwald and Dachau concentration camps within days of liberation, and what they saw left enduring impressions on minds and hearts. We at the Simon Wiesenthal Center heard this compelling testimony from Samuel Pizar, today a world famous international lawyer, who back in 45 was a 15 year old skeleton, a youngster who barely survived a death march from Dachau. Quote, I was running closer and closer to the American tank. The hatch opened and a tall helmeted black man climbed out. I'd never seen a black man before. He must have seen that I was a weak, sick looking, with a shaven head. The only thing I can think of was to kneel, to put my arms around his legs and to begin to yell in the few words of English my mother had signed when she prayed for our deliverance. God bless America. African-American Jewish civil rights cooperation had roots dating back before World War I, from the founding of the NAACP in 1909. Jewish lawyers like Jack Greenberg helped draw up the briefs that Thurgood Marshall presented in 1954 to the U.S. Supreme Court, which changed history by outlawing Jim Crow schools. Jews, including Stanley Levison, a member of ML King's Inner Circle, were part and crucial to the success of the SCLC. In 1963, at the March on Washington, young Jews carried signs reading in Hebrew and English the biblical quotation inscribed on the base of the Liberty Bell, Ukratem Dror B'chola Aretz, proclaim liberty throughout the land. As many as a third of the white I guess that makes you white tonight. As the white Northern College students, some of whom risked their lives to join the 1964 Freedom Summer to register black voters were Jews. Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwermer were lynched besides black Mississippian James Earl Cheney. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who fled Hitler's Germany and became a close friend of Martin Luther King Jr marched with him hand in hand in Selma in 1965 because he believed that, quote, the exodus is far from completed. M.L. King became a Jewish hero, not least because the Jewish state of Israel always remained a central part of his vision. Almost a year after the 1967 Six Day War, he said these words, I see Israel and never mind saying it, as one of the great outposts of democracy in the world, and a marvelous example of how desert land almost can be transformed into an oasis of brotherhood and democracy. But it was not only his consistent support for Israel that attracted so many young and generally clueless Jews like me. Many of us were angry about the injustices we saw around us, by the still open wound of six million dead European Jews, and by the failure of the very same Jewish establishment to save those victims or to speak out for three million 
more Jews trapped in the spiritual dead end known as the Soviet Union. At a time when most Jewish leaders fear to poke the Soviet bear, Dr. King spoke out again and again, and his feelings were summed up in these powerful words. Quote, I cannot stand idly by, even though I live in the United States, even though I happen to be an American Negro, and fail to be concerned about what happens to my brothers and sisters who happen to be Jews in Soviet Russia. For what happens to them happens to me and to you." Unquote. Those acts of solidarity alone would have confirmed him as our hero, but it was his vocabulary that made him our teacher, our Rebbe. For the words of our prophets were his most potent weapons. He told the Synagogue Council of America in December 1965, quote, the Hebrew prophets belong to all people because their concepts of justice and equality have become ideals for all races and civilizations. The Hebrew prophets are needed today because we need their flaming courage. We need them because of the thunder of their voices is the only sound stronger than the blast of bombs. To graduates of Lincoln University, <clears throat> he put it thus, so let us be maladjusted, as maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of injustice of his day could cry out in words that echo across the centuries, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Martin Luther King not only knew this Jewish dictum, he lived it. We believe that in remembrance lie the roots of salvation, in forgetfulness the roots of destruction. Tonight, we promise the six million and our Rebbe, Dr. King, we will never forget. <laughs>